Hello, I'm Miyako Yamada, Professor of Sociology at Purdue University, Fort Wayne. Teaching critical race theory at K-12 school has been debated and become a hot-button issue. The term CRT suddenly appears everywhere, reaching out to the media attention. In fact, critical race theory is not new, but it's been taught and discussed for decades in academia. Actually, it is a graduate level concentration and requires sophisticated knowledge and understanding. It is difficult to provide a simple or satisfying answer to the question about CRT. In order to invite speakers from different academic fields and learn about their perspective, I'm holding two panel discussions. We will discuss how critical race theory is understood and explore why people are split on this theory. For today's discussion, I have two speakers from PFW. Dr. Andrew Down, Associate Professor of Political Science and Director of the Mike Down Center for the Indiana Politics. Dr. Joe Nichols, Professor of Education. Thank you for joining this session. Thank you. Good to be with you. Before we start, let me give a brief background of critical race theory. The roots of CRT are associated with civil rights movement during the 1950s and the race-related registration of 1960s. CRT evolved out of the law school and the sociology of law. This theory received much attention in 1980 when legal scholar Derek Bell um, criticized the U.S. Supreme Court's decision on Brown versus Board of Education. Basically, CRT argued that the racism is institutionalized in U.S. history, system, and politics, and e examine how institutionalized and systematic racism shapes individuals' views on the law, racial category, and the privilege. The contemporary scholarship in critical race theory focuses on the role of race in politics and law but it has been widely studied by social scientists as well as legal scholars. Now let's begin our discussion. Since all of us uh, from different fields, I want us to talk about uh, how race, critical race theory is uh, used and viewed in your field. Shall we start with the Andy? Sure. I, uh, technically, I'm actually a sociologist, as Mieko knows. I, I graduated from IPFW. I have a master's degree and PhD. Uh, but my, my area of interest and work these days is state and local politics as well as public policy. But when you start talking about sociology or about political science, you're talking about uh, fields that have been around for a long time. And so uh, a theory that is as relatively recent as critical race theory in some respects is not insignificant, but it's not, it's not one of the main theories that's going to get discussed a lot. That's not to say that critical theory is not discussed. That is, it has been for over 100 years we've been discussing mm -hmm. critical theory. To add the modifier race in there is a recent thing, and it takes up sort of a, a small part of a discussion about which theories one might use to examine uh, a variety of issues. Uh, and what I can say is that in my experience, whether it is in the sociology program I came out of or the political science programs I'm familiar with, it really is kind of a small part of a much broader discussion of theories and approaches to looking at institutions and voting behavior and political science more generally. So it is not something that takes up a huge part of what we do. Right. For those of us who spend a little more time uh, in the, you know, in, I don't want to say in the real world, but looking at uh, politics in action, so to speak, we can think of moments when it became a bit more important. Lonnie Guineer being nominated for Department of Justice by President Clinton. It was not called CRT at the time, but she basically had written about critical race theory. So critical theory was discussed, uh, but it was understood as part of a broader understanding of things and not limited to just race or as the only way to view anything. So for us in political science, it always has to be kept in context, that it is one of many ways of looking at things, and even one of many ways of thinking of critical theory. Okay, great. What about Joe from uh, education field? Well, I'm in the School of Education here at PFW, and uh, we're basically in the business of trying to educate and teach the future teachers. 
And uh, I work a lot with students that want to become middle school and high school teachers. And a, a core group of those students that I work with want to become social studies teachers someday. And so I think that's why critical race theory is important for people to understand. And it's important for our students to understand what it is and how it's defined because some of those uh, social studies teachers that will be teaching American history, they'll be teaching sociology, uh, that's important for them to um, be able to uh, teach that particular theory as Andy said, among a lot of the others that they're going to be looking at in those classes. So I think it's important for us to keep in mind that when we say critical race theory, we're not talking about being critical about things, even though that word is in the title, critical race theory. Looking at things critically, that's part of our job here at the university. We're trying to encourage students to look at things critically, not negatively, but in other words, critically in terms of look at it from a deep perspective and look at it from a different point of view and a different lens and that's mm -hmm. why they come to a university mm -hmm. and we should be doing that in K through 12 education too we want our students to become critical thinkers mm -hmm. even at fourth fifth sixth seventh grade level we want them to be critical thinkers in other mm -hmm. words be able to think deeply about things and not just spit out and memorize information mm -hmm. so that's why it's an important topic and it's currently you know controversial in not just Indiana but you know throughout the country because a lot of people uh, are opposed to being taught in K through 12 education. And so it's real important for people to understand definitions and to try to get their terms clear about what it actually means. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, yeah, thank you, Joe. Now, uh, you know, you already started the second question I'm going to actually ask. Uh, you know, well, that, that's actually perfect. CRT has been a hot button topic now, right? So uh, some states have created bills that will ban teaching critical race theory in elementary, middle, and high school. So what do you think about that kind of, uh, you know, attitude? I think before we begin to start banning things, I think we need to be real clear about what the definitions are and what mm -hmm. critical race theory encompasses, and that's real important. We don't want to eliminate some things that would be good for kids to be talking about and learning about in K-12 through schools. Uh, certainly, potentially, there are some things that can be controversial about that, but that's okay to have those controversial discussions. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly at the high school level and the junior high level as well. Uh, that's how kids learn, and that's how we uh, try to understand uh, different things from you know, different, different lenses. A lot of us grow up in communities where, I don't want to say we're sheltered, but we, there's not, we don't have a lot of other ways to think about things other than how, it's, how things are thought about in that community sometimes. And once they come to a university, well, then they really are exposed to a lot of different ways to think about things. And I think that's real important uh, that we be doing that even at the high school level to try to get kids to think about things. But uh, the thing that we have to be cautious of is we have to make sure that a lot of things that might be seen as negative within schools, that it's not thrown under the umbrella of critical race theory. Mm -hmm. Because then everything gets distorted, I think, in terms of how we try to define what that is. And a lot of times people will throw a lot of their strong beliefs about things that don't have anything to do with critical race theory, but they'll throw that under that umbrella. And uh, then it makes everything a little bit convoluted in terms of how we have those discussions, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, good. Well, Andy, what, what do you think if people are really split on teaching critical race theory? Well, I, I think we, in some respects, we need to keep the, the countrywide aspect of this in mind. There are something like 28 states that introduced some kind of legislation mm -hmm. that dealt with the issue. But I think there was only one, Idaho, I think, that actually mentioned critical race theory by name. The rest spoke generally about concepts. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the pieces of legislation that a lot of people have brought up is actually from Oklahoma. It's known as House Bill or HB 1775. Mm -hmm. And I brought a copy of it with me. but. I want to read part of it because it helps, I think it helps people understand how difficult it might be to put this into practice within a classroom. And remember, Joe's talking with people who are pre-service teachers. They're, mm -hmm. They've not taught yet. They're not out in the field. Right. This, I'm pretty sure, will be pretty confusing to them, let alone uh, once they get out in the field. And there are teachers from Oklahoma who flat out said, I'm not sure what I can or cannot teach mm -hmm. based on this bill. Mm -hmm. So what it says is, 
No teacher, administrator, or other employee of a school, district, charter school, or virtual charter school shall require or make part of a course the following concepts. And then there are six of them mentioned. One race or sex is inherently superior to another race or sex. An individual by virtue of his or her race or sex is inherently racist, sexist, or oppressive, whether consciously or unconsciously. An individual should, should, should be discriminated against or receive adverse treatment solely or partly because of his or her race or sex. Members of one race or sex cannot and should not attempt to treat others without respect to race or sex. An individual's moral character is necessarily determined by his or her race or sex. An individual by virtue of his race or sex bears responsibility for actions committed in the past by other members of the same race or sex. And there's actually one more, I apologize or two more, an individual should feel discomfort, guilt, anguish, or any other form of psychological distress on account of his or her race or sex, or meritocracy or traits such as hard work, eth or hard work ethic are racist or sexist and were created by members of a particular race to oppress members of another race. That's an awful lot. And really, when you start thinking about any examination of a society, in some respects, you've, you've endangered any sort of critical analysis of that. Just looking at housing patterns, for example, or educational patterns within a community, some might say could potentially violate this. Mm -hmm. And that is uh, part of the problem here. If we're going to have a real conversation about race, if we're going to have a real conversation about the effects of race or gender or any other characteristic, mm -hmm. we have to be able to have that conversation Critically, we have to be able to look at data, and we have to, and I do this in class all the time, we have to say to students, I want you to look at it from another perspective. I'm not saying you have to accept it, but you need to be able to look at it from that other mm -hmm. perspective. And that's where they learn good critical thinking skills. That's when they get exposed to other points of view. That's when we build a real understanding of things. And what I have found over the years is when you present data to students, mm -hmm. they quite often will say, yeah, maybe that's something we should address. And then we can talk about how to address it. Mm -hmm. They don't always say that, but they quite often come to that conclusion on their own. Mm -hmm. Well, um, actually, what I hear from both of you, there is a misunderstanding uh, about the term critical, being critical. I know people tend to be negative you know, when, they, when you hear you know, critical, but you know, that's not true. Being critical means we are also uh, make an argument, but at the same time we gonna accept, you know, disagreement, disagreement too, so that uh, we can kind of continue having that conversation to um, make a constructive, you know, um, criticism or you know, um, argument, you know, together. I think making, you know, creating a dialogue is really, you know, I important too. And um, not, now we started to really discuss and you know, teaching critical race theory at K to 12. And that's the kind of you know a core issue. Uh, what do you think about you know teaching you know K, uh, CRT at the K to 12? Do you would you agree or disagree? Or you don't have to say you know agree or disagree. But what do you think about that in, in general? I do have opinion, but I, I will just you know, let you say <laughs> first. <laughs> well, I think. Go ahead. You have a no. no you to go. <laughs> you know, I think Oklahoma has tried to. I'm from Oklahoma originally, oh. uh, and I think they've tried to define their um, um, issues that maybe uh, are troublesome to them, and they've tried to to lay it out in those particular steps. I'm not sure I necessarily agree with those, but they've tried to define that, and I think that's important. Um, you know, K through 12 education is so broad. And an example, let's think about this for a second. So an example, if I ask a child, what is two plus three? And they tell me five. Well, we can memorize those kinds of mathematics facts all the time. But if I ask them, why is two plus three five? Well, now that's a different, that's a different question. And so kids begin to sort of start thinking about, well, I know that it's five, but why is that? And so we start to get them to kind of think at a different level than just memorizing information and so I think part of what critical race theory is about is trying to get people to understand uh, historically about what the laws have been in the United States from our from our very beginning 
as a country, uh, even up till now when we're, you know, we have discussions about um, voting laws, particularly in the South, and how maybe some of those kinds of issues are not fair to people of color or people that live in poverty areas. And so that's real important for high school kids to be thinking about those particular issues. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, I think that's real important. I think it can be done by a skillful high school social studies teacher to where mm -hmm. people don't feel guilty, to where people don't feel <clears throat> like they're um, uh, being looked down upon based upon their race or their gender or whatever that happens to be. But it has to, it has to be a skillful teacher that, mm -hmm. that knows how to do that and uh, that where students feel comfortable and safe in the classroom. And that's important, you know, when you're having those kinds of discussions, um, everybody needs to feel like that their opinion is important and that it's welcome. But that's how we learn is by hearing mm -hmm. other people's opinions about things. Yeah, my uh, actually personal question and also concern is about actually the uh, teachers, the education, I think, um, higher ed institution, how yeah. do they teach? What do they teach to be prepared, you know, to have you know, sure. students to be prepared for teaching, and especially sociology and also in critical race theory. So um, unless, and I specialize race and ethnicity in sociology, so I do teach race and ethnicity. I teach that in a theory too. So I'm trained to teach and you know, talk about you know, race and racism, anti-racist attitude, that kind of thing. So unless you're trained to talk about, to teach you know, that critical race theory, it's really difficult. So I wonder sure. how even you know, current high school teacher to really be prepared for teaching critical race theory. Like, um, I don't know, if I were a high school teacher, I may not really you know, say critical race theory. I don't know, maybe depending on level, but uh, you know, uh, rather I'll, I'll try to promote anti-racist attitude, you know, uh, what should be done, shouldn't be done, you know, kind of thing to make it kind of you know, simple. Well, here's another know. example. You know, I grew up in Oklahoma and in, you know, in 1921, they had the huge race riot there in Tulsa in the Greenwood neighborhood yes. uh, where uh, arguably, there were maybe hundreds of people that were killed during that particular race wow. riot. That was never talked about in any Oklahoma history class that wow. I ever had. Uh, it was not mentioned in any of the textbooks or anything like that. I was 30 years old before wow. I had even heard of something like that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those kinds of things need to be talked about and yes. need to be discussed so that we don't make those same mistakes in the uh -huh. future. We don't want to have those kind of things happen again. So that's important right. for us to have those discussions. Uh -huh. I agree. Andy, well, what, what are you saying about in the teaching? Well, uh, uh, since I'm not in ed studies, I'll, I'll leave that up to Joe to decide whether, <laughs> whether and how a uh, teacher could be ready for that. I, I actually did spend a couple of years teaching in a high school, a college course in a high school, uh, and it is, it's a different environment. Uh, there's no doubt about it. That, that transition from senior in high school to first year college student, that something happens over the summer, there's, the setting is different. There's an awful lot that's different about it. But where I was doing that, they asked me to teach as much like a college class as possible. And so I did um, put them in a position quite often, you know, show them data and say, what, what kind of conclusion can you draw from the data? Yeah. Part of what I found to be an important um, element of that, though, was making sure that students understood when they were going too far with the data. So in other words, if the data suggests something, then you can only say it suggests it. You can't say it proves this thing if it doesn't prove it. And beginning to get that, that sort of nuanced understanding of data uh, in, in collaboration with the idea that I want you to look at something from another perspective. You don't have to agree with it, but can you explain it from that other perspective? That's really developing the mind in a way that I think is helpful, not only in terms of what happens in a community then, but even you know, if somebody goes into business someplace they need to understand what their clients are looking for, and they need to be able to think like their client, and they need to be able to use data so that they can interact with their clients appropriately. So it's a skill that is transferable to every field, I would argue, but it's one that also has much greater benefit for the community at large. And I'll tell you, whether it was in that high school or with many of the students I see here at PFW, when you show them maps that show, for example, educational attainment within a community or income level or any one of a number of demographic uh, pieces of information, they're often surprised by that. 
mm. uh, because that's not the way they're used to looking at the world. And that then opens up that opportunity to ask, what, what does this data then tell us? Mm. Uh, and then if they seem to be getting excited about it, are they excited because they think there's something that needs to happen because of it? Are they mm -hmm. excited because they think it shows some sort of promise or progress? If so, what's that? And then let's make sure that we look at another point of view, at least one other point of view. Well, actually, you know, I have, I don't know, one or two more questions, actually, I, I want to ask. Um, well, one question is, you know, what will be the, con you know, major contribution of critical race theory? And if you can think about, I don't know, shortcoming, you know, any, um, I wouldn't say negative, but uh, any limitation of critical race theory, what will be, you know, for both uh, actually benefits and, and the limitation? For me, I'm going to look at it in terms of what's going on in communities right, right. now. A as far as I'm concerned, it is opening up an opportunity mm -hmm. to have, quite frankly, very difficult conversations. Mm -hmm. The question is, can we take advantage of that? Right. Uh, and obviously there are places that have been more and less effective at doing that. Mm -hmm. I get what Oklahoma was trying to do and trying to like set the parameters for it. I'm not sure that a general assembly is the right body to be helping to establish those <laughs> parameters. Mm -hmm. uh, but they, they were sort of, you can make the argument they were trying to have a conversation since it went through a legislative process. We can disagree or agree whether they mm -hmm. were successful or not. Uh, but for me, that's the big contribution. This is a moment where yeah. a very difficult conversation mm -hmm. can be had, not just about race, but about gender and about a variety of other things. Mm -hmm. That's important for communities to understand not only where they came from, but right. where they want to go. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think we are talking about the intersectionality, right? You know, not just race and ethnicity, but also gender, you know, sexual orientation, religion, age, and you know, all, you know, kind of, you know, social factor. I think that's really, you know, uh, I agree, that's a major contribution from the critical race theory. Uh, wh what about Joe, what, what do you think? Uh, either or both, you know, limitation, contribution? Yeah, you know, Miko, in the last two or three years, yes. we have had in our country a lot of difficult conversations and a lot of difficult mm -hmm. challenges, uh, whether it's been in politics or whether it's been based upon race or whatever that happens to be. We've had a lot of difficult, or COVID, you know. Um, yes. uh, we've just had a lot of difficult conversations in the last two or three years. And I think um, the biggest contribution of critical race theory, at least as we, as we define it that way, is we tr have to try to think about, well, how can we make things better for the future? You know, how can we keep from, from establishing laws that are unfair to certain groups of people? And how can we, how can we keep from establishing future legislation or laws that are, um, you know, that encourage uh, racism or encourage uh, the disenfranchisement of uh, uh, certain groups of people. Mm -hmm. And that's important for us to think about. We don't want to have a future country that does that. At least I don't anyway. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's the biggest contribution is it opens up a dialogue and conversation. Mm -hmm. And that's the only way that we improve things for the future is if we talk about those things. Right, yeah. If we keep silent about it, we're going to continue to do the same things that we've been doing. And mm -hmm. so we have to talk about that right. and, yeah, and discuss exactly. those things. Yeah, exactly. Um, In, Indiana has not been immune to this, obviously. We've seen news stories about this. Uh, the Attorney General Todd Rakita mm -hmm. created his parents' bill of rights. Uh, some of which I don't think people would disagree with. Yeah, parents should be involved in education. They should be looking at what curriculum mm -hmm. is taught, et cetera. Sure. Uh, the way he went about having his discussions offended a number of people, and some of mm -hmm. the implications elsewhere in the bill, uh, Parents' Bill of Rights offended some people. But at the same time, he actually uh, helped to educate people. I doubt there are too many people who understood what the Indiana Ed Standards are. Not that they get that from his document, but they know to go look at them. Mm -hmm. In spite of how much teachers try to emphasize to parents, you know, this is what we're supposed to be teaching at this level. You know, parents need to hear that from a variety of sources. Right. And then he also actually cited the Indiana Code and said, do you, you want to understand what your child can and cannot be forced to do? Go read what our own legislature has done. And I think there might be some people, if they were to read through that, they might say, well, wait a minute, I'm not sure I agree with that. Uh, they might want to see some changes, probably in both directions. Mm -hmm. uh, but that is, once again, one of those moments for education. And unfortunately, as Joe pointed out, because we are 
so divisive right now. A lot of people, as soon as Todd Rakita said something, said, well, I don't like him, therefore I don't like what he had to mm. say. Uh, and my point of view is you can disagree with him, but you should probably at least look at what he had to say and see if there's something in there that's, that's worth uh, considering and discussing and seeing mm -hmm. if maybe there is some common ground. Right, so that we can have objective, you know, good, you know, um, civil conversation, of course. Sure. And, uh, uh, you know, I, w whenever I teach race and ethnic relations, I, you know, tell my students, I'm taking risk. Always, I talk about racism. You know, no, nobody wants to talk about, you know, discrimination, prejudice, and nobody wants to be called racist. You know, I'm not going to call that. But, you know, we can't avoid, you know, talking about racism because we never resolved that issue, you know, after more than 50 years civil rights movement happened. Still we suffer from racism, actually the prejudice and discrimination based on, yeah, on the basis of race, ethnicity, you know, gender, you know, class, or all kind of issue. Then, so to me, like a critical race theory is just one theory, you know, which allow us to dis uh, discuss kind of invisible, hidden voices of uh, experience of especially minority, you know, groups. So, um, in your classes, uh, have you had a chance to talk about critical race theory, particularly, or I don't know, in general? You know, in the classes that I teach, that typically is not necessarily a specific topic that we look at. Mm -hmm. It may come up in a casual conversation, or maybe a student has seen something on the news, mm -hmm. <clears throat> or maybe I'll bring it up because something has happened in one of the schools and it's being talked about in, right. in a school context. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but we typically, I don't typically look at something specific like that. Now, if I was teaching a methods course in social yes. studies where mm -hmm. I'm actually teaching the pedagogy and the methodology of how to teach social studies, mm -hmm. you know, in the near future for high school teachers, that's probably something that I would talk about in class. If you look at the Indiana standards for social studies, it's a huge list of things mm -hmm. that, have, that social studies teachers have to cover. And like you said, critical race theory is a really small part. Uh, of maybe something that that could be taught, you know, at the at the K through 12 level, mm -hmm. and so, um, uh, but uh, certainly methods teachers uh, should probably be looking at that and at least having some discussions in their classes about whether this is something that should be added to the uh, state standards or whether it shouldn't be added to the state standards. That's a discussion that needs to happen, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about I, I, I would actually like to remind people that if they go to the Indiana Department of Education webpage, they can actually find the standards. I mean, they're actually there. They're fairly easy to find. They're for all the easy. content areas, for all, social for studies, all, yeah, for exactly. math, uh -huh. language all arts. All of them yeah. are there. And they really are interesting reading, I would say. I think a lot of people might be surprised. And while, of course, a lot of people are concerned that education has become too proscriptive, mm. There still is, because of the wide variety of what has to be covered, there's still some flexibility in there for how somebody is going to teach something. And that's another one of those opportunities where I think we can build additional understanding, where we can uh, take a slightly different view at, at uh, something. But I encourage people to go read that. In my classes, I've not yet had anybody this semester mention critical race theory. Uh, masks and vaccines have come up, uh, and for that matter, seeking public opinion. Uh, as in what should public comment periods look like, but I've not had anybody mention CRT specifically. What about any, not, not just students, but also the people around you, you know, ask, you know, approach you and asking about critical race theory? Because I have been actually approached by some, you know, people that I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you know, they, they ask me about critical race theory and um, I, find kind of difficult to talk about it using kind of simple and easy, you know, words and expression because I think I'm trained to, you know, talk about that in a theory, you know, um, kind of formal way, <laughs> so. Yeah, there, there are times when we academics sound like we're academics and we, we don't necessarily right. give the easiest explanation for things. That's certainly true. Uh, for me, I have had people come up to me to talk to me about uh, how do they run for office and those sorts of issues uh, because for some of them, they, they want to run for office. Mm -hmm. And the, the folks who wanted to talk to me about that have come from multiple perspectives. It's not like everybody is in favor of or in opposition to any particular issue. 
Um, people, there does seem to be an increased interest in curriculum, mm -hmm. which is, I think, an outgrowth of the CRT discussion, as well as others. And then, really, for a lot of folks, it's, it's about masks and vaccine mandates. That's, um, mm -hmm. I think that has gotten a little more attention here in Northeast Indiana than anything the ed standards have managed to bring up. Mm -hmm. yeah. what, what about Joe? Do you, have you know, locally we've had some school board meetings that have been disrupted mm -hmm. by um, um, parents who are upset about mask mandates or about vaccines and those kinds mm -hmm. of things, like Andy said. Um, <clears throat> you know, I've been approached by a few people in the community, friends of mine that I've known for a long time, uh, and I think they get their information sometimes from maybe unreliable sources. So mm -hmm. maybe they get their information from what they hear on TV or from a radio talk program or something like that. Uh, and a lot of times, particularly when it revolves around critical race theory, I think they're getting misinformation. Uh, and so I try to correct them on that. And I'm, it's not well received because they've already made up their mind that <laughs> this is what critical race theory is. Mm. And I tell them, well, no, that's not really what, I try to be nice about it. And I tell them, well, no, that's not really what it is. And they are, you know, they are very determined to believe what they've heard from mm -hmm. somebody that's, that's spoken, like I said, on a radio talk show or on TV right. or something like that. And yeah. so it's a, it's a difficult challenge to mm -hmm. try to help people or to, to help convince people that we ought to talk about that mm -hmm. uh, so that we, we can understand what, what something like critical race theory actually is because people get their minds made up pretty quickly and it's difficult to get them to change. Mm -hmm. like, like Andy said, well, you know, we can use data in our classes and that helps students understand things right. tremendously. Mm -hmm. uh, that's terrific to use that kind of source mm -hmm. uh, to help students understand things, but it's, uh, it's, sometimes it's an uphill battle. It's difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is actually, this is a great example of when, if you point somebody to the DOE and, and the ED standards there, uh, it's a little more difficult for them to come back with the argument if you, you know, here's the source, mm -hmm. just show me in here where the thing you heard on the radio or your neighbor or your uncle, sure. whoever, show me where it says that. Um, and you can be, obviously don't do that in a confrontational way because what you're really doing is giving them the information to become a more informed individual. This, however, is one of the problems we have, or challenges we have, with mm -hmm. a representative democracy. Mm -hmm. I don't have to know every issue because I've elected people to do those things. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, if I'm like a lot of voters, I get a little bit of information and that's enough for me because I, I actually think, well, I don't need to know all of this because that's what I elected them to do. And it becomes very easy for people to get just a tidbit that um, is taken out of context or you know, missing some facts and data and that get blown way out of proportion. It's easy for us to get angry. It's mm -hmm. much more difficult for us to sort of seek to understand. Mm -hmm. uh, but when the person does come up and say, well, this is what I've heard. Fortunately, given my time here at the university, mm -hmm. people often follow that up with, well, where can I find more information? So, you mm -hmm. know, we as academics become the source of information. And then we can say, check out the ed standard, check out what the Indiana code says, right. check out what the court says, mm -hmm. you know, actually call the school corporation and ask what's been taught in, mm -hmm. in this particular class, as mm -hmm. opposed to relying on uh, somebody else. Right, yeah, exactly. Uh, that's what we, and how we approach that kind of issue, right, when we come across. And um, actually, this is kind of going back to, you know, uh, one of our original question, but, you know, there are lots of theory, especially in, a, uh, in the race, ethnic relations in the United States, that there are more, of course, in a sociology and also in a, uh, education and political science field, too. But you know, only all of a sudden, you know, critical race theory is picked up. To me, like, uh, okay, you know, there are lots of theory, you know, we can talk about race theory, you know, because I teach those th theories. And then it doesn't mean we agree with it. But, uh, you know, there is a, actually a moment also place in a class where we discuss, you know, what do you think about this? You know, what, what are sh uh, limitations and a contribution of each theory? Uh, earlier, of course, the traditional theory is assimilation to discuss race you know, relations in the United States. And then, you know, um, assimilation, actually p policy and uh, theory really, you know, focuses on so-called white, you know, culture, you know, white privilege. Then 
so now you know we we have more you know theory uh, racial formation you know um, of course that's uh, one of the um, most comprehensive theory you know becoming now in you know, a classical but now uh, um, compared to those theory critical race theory is really I, I think a more recent you know theory you know to, to discuss more more like a contemporary you know race and ethnic relations issue. I think it, because in the past couple of years, I think that critical race theory has risen to the top of the discussion a lot of times. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, in the times that we live in now, um, critical race theory is becoming political, mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. and it's becoming it's becoming divided based upon political party sometimes. And mm -hmm. so that's unfortunate that uh, because you are a member of one political party, then you must believe everything that that political party is standing for and mm -hmm. I don't believe that's necessarily the case and unfortunately again I think critical race theory is dividing people um, and part of it's a division uh, because of the political parties that they belong to at times mm -hmm. and so that's a difficult discussion as well because people feel very strongly about politics particularly in the last couple right. of years and yeah. so critical theory is is being thrown into that discussion and mm -hmm. that's where it's sort of gets very confusing sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when like, like Joe said, political orientation is a really strong you know, impact. Sure. What, what do you think, you know, uh, Joe, our, uh, the our, Andy? Our colleague Mike Wolf in uh, political science did, has done some research on the effects of this sort of language. Um, I'm, I'm putting words in his mouth so he can, he can come on the show later <laughs> on and correct, every, correct everything I say. But here is, here is one of the takeaways from his research. The divisive language, the fiery language, the raw meat type stuff inspires the partisans. It turns off the people in the middle. So if you think about campaigns as something you want to win, there's no, there's no second place. You know, campaigns are binary. You win or you lose. If you want to win and you know you can win because you energize your base, then in many respects you have no reason to try and bring the middle to you. Mm -hmm. And that's why we see an awful lot of people looking for a way to divide, looking for a wedge that they can get in, because that will bring up their turnout. It'll turn off the people in the middle who may or may not be for them. Uh, they hope that it doesn't activate the other side, but they've done the calculations by then and they've figured out, now I can win with my base. And it really ends up uh, having a detrimental effect on voter turnout. Mm -hmm. uh, that is problematic. And I would contend that to this point, uh, or at, at this point in time, when you look at voter registration rates, the, uh, about a third of the population claims to have one letter after their name, a third has the other letter after their name, and about a third claim to be independent. Mm -hmm. They're looking for something else. They're, they're, the group of people who are turned off by the, the fiery language. And that group is larger than it has been in a long time. Exactly. The independent exactly. group. Exactly, yes. Number, the percentage yeah. of those. Mm -hmm. what, when you look at them, about 8 to 10 percent of that independent group are truly independent. I mean, literally could go either way. The rest of them are leaning in one direction or the other. They're being driven away from their party. They mm -hmm. no longer start with, yes, I am A, pick your favorite letter, Instead, they start with, I'm an independent, and then when forced to say, well, do you lean one way or the other, they fall back to where they were. Whereas, you know, 20 years ago, they would have said, yes, I am a Republican, or I am a Democrat who's moderate. Now it's, I'm an independent. Well, if you're going to make me say which way I lean, I lean to the D or I lean to the R. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's really interesting. Um, yeah, we are actually almost done, but uh, um, last comments from... Andy, Joe, anything um, before we finish? <laughs> well, you know, what we try to do in the School of Education is, again, we're, we're in the process of training teachers for the future, from preschool all the way up to um, seniors in high school. Mm -hmm. And so we are not going to stop trying to help our students become critical thinkers. Mm -hmm. That's important. Um, no matter how controversial that, that becomes, uh, we want them to be deep thinkers and try to th try to think think of things at a deeper level. Uh, so critically means not negatively, but critically basically means we're trying to get people to think outside of the box and to think about what the future can have, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for us. And 
and uh, to be creative about how they think about things and look at things from another lens other than just their own, and that's mm -hmm. important. I think a whole, you know, educator, in, including us, have a whole, you know, huge responsibility sure. for, you know, fostering, you know, critical thinker, right? Andy? One of the definitions a number of my colleagues and I use for politics is how we decide who gets what, when, and how. Mm. It's a simple definition, so, you know, a lot of students can read it. It doesn't have a lot of extra words in it. It's how we decide who gets what, when, and how. Uh, and it works very well as a definition. So when we, when we take that as a starting point for what we're doing in political science, mm -hmm. we're studying how yeah. we decide who gets what, when, and how, mm -hmm. it opens up possibilities for looking at things from a systemic point of view, uh, but also looking at individual topics. Right. And it really provides some opportunity. These days, one of the things I've noticed is there are some classes that do not want to touch controversial issues. They're tired. So they're happy to talk about institutionalism, mm -hmm. and when we talk about it, let's not worry about bringing up a vaccine mandate or something like that. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about something from a long time ago, which for them means the 1990s. But still, <laughs> you know, the part of what we have to do as instructors is look for those opportunities to make the same points, help them learn the same thing mm -hmm. without getting caught up in the, the fight, whatever the mm -hmm. fight of the day is. That's one of the things I would say. Another thing I would say is uh, several of us believe in deliberation in the Department of Political Science here. Without deliberation, uh, we're, we're worse off. Right. And so, for example, Mike Wolf once again actually teaches a class on deliberative democracy the principles that are used in that are used in many of our classes. Mm -hmm. We want students to, to not only understand their position, but why it's their position mm -hmm. and why someone has a different one. Mm -hmm. That makes for a much deeper, richer conversation and quite frankly, makes them better at basically any job they will ever have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I agree. Um, when I teach race and ethnic relations, especially, um, well, students tend to be quiet, right? Because nobody w wants to talk about, um, you know, discrimination and prejudice. I understand that, you know, also they're really afraid of making a mistake. You know, I told them that, uh, you know, you can make a mistake in a classroom, but you can't make a mistake in your life because you're gonna lose huge. You know, um, so you know that that would be really you know huge, huge negative consequences. So, um, so I really you know, appreciate uh, you know students actually courage to talk about you know um, you know discrimination, prejudice, and uh, um, I think we have to create that an opportunity, you know, um, university level so that uh, you um, yeah the students can foster critical race, uh, critical uh, uh, thinking skills. And uh, that, that's really important for their lives, not for the you know, academic you know, coursework, but also the, their lives too. So I think yeah, we're that's trying really to create better citizens. Right, yeah, exactly. Uh, we want to have a, a community in the Fort Wayne area or wherever we live. We want to have people that are, are participating you know, in the process, in the community, to make our community a better place to live. That's mm -hmm. what we all want. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Yeah, not speaking and uh, um, just being quiet is also supporting racism. That's what I, you know, tell students. So, um, yeah, just fostering, you know, critical <coughs> thinking skills and uh, I hope that they'll, they'll be more confident, you know, uh, also to be more encouraged to you know, talk about, I think, engage in dialogue to actually resolve that uh, issue. So. Uh, over the years, I've talked with a lot of people about what it's like to testify before a city council mm -hmm. or at the General Assembly. And I always tell them, stick to what you know. Mm -hmm. And then I say, it is perfectly fine to say, mm -hmm. I don't know. Right, yeah, yeah, exactly. uh, and that's good for a couple of reasons. Number one, recognizing your own limitations. I think it's important right. we were able to do that. Mm -hmm. Recognize your opportunity for growth and mm -hmm. bringing in new information. And then finally, creating an opportunity for you to then continue to engage after the meeting with mm -hmm. those elected officials. So when you say, I always tell them, when you say to mm -hmm. a city council member, I don't know, it should be followed with, but I'll get the answer for mm -hmm. you because you, now you've created an opportunity to continue the engagement right. beyond that one mm -hmm. moment. Uh, and that continues to develop networks. 
We know the strength of weak networks to use Granovetter's work. It, it, is, it is imperative that students recognize that. And don't be afraid to say, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Just remember to go find mm -hmm. the answer to. Yeah. Just go find the answer to. Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay, well, and now we have to end our discussion. I hope our panel discussion will help the audience understand the CRT and the race-related issue. Thank you very much for your participation and contribution today. Thanks for having My me. Pleasure, thanks.